certainly on the list for possible uh, eradication. It remains a very important cause of, uh, of uh, death and morbidity in uh, children uh, worldwide. And the basics of why this virus can be eradicated were really uh, outlined in uh, 1846 by Peter Panham when he uh, was involved in uh, helping uh, to uh, uh, not control but uh, <laughs> work on a measles outbreak that occurred in the Faroe Islands. And the measles had not been in those islands for the previous 60 years and when an outbreak occurred, uh, essentially the things he observed as a, as a clinician were that the disease was contagious. You only got it if you were exposed to someone with measles. It had a 14-day incubation period. There was a 100% attack rate for susceptibles, so it was highly uh, infectious. And if you recovered from measles and uh, had been in the island 60 years before, you were immune from uh, uh, acquiring the disease a second time. Now we can put numbers now to many of those uh, observations. This was prior to obviously even understanding infection, uh, let alone viral infection, uh, uh, Panem's observations. But we know that the R0, which is a measure of the infectivity of uh, uh, various pathogens, uh, is very high for, for measles. So it's an approximation of the number of people that would be infected from a single uh, individual. So, uh, <coughs> so measles is, uh, is uh, much more infectious actually than, uh, than smallpox. So it spreads quite readily and this is part of the problems with uh, measles control. Another observation that we now have numbers for is this long-term immunity that's established by uh, recovery uh, from measles. And so these are, are data that were acquired from actually uh, workers in a primate facility who were bled very regularly over many years uh, just as a part of monitoring uh, their exposure to uh, various pathogens. And this, but these are their measles titers for individual uh, people. So <laughs> they're absolutely stable over very long periods of time. And the half-life was calculated <laughs> to be 3,014 years. <laughs> so. <laughs> Long-term immunity, uh, for, for sure. So we've been studying, so we're interested in, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the research that we've done, and as well as the uh, sort of epidemiology and the eradication uh, issues. But <coughs> we've been very interested in how you establish this lifelong uh, immunity. What are the characteristics of measles infection that allow for this to occur? And this is just a summary slide of a lot of data that I'm not going to show you. But <laughs> one of the observations is that measles virus RNA actually peaks during the time of the, uh, the rash and the acute disease, but then persists for very long periods of time. And in fact, it persists in lymph nodes for uh, certainly uh, many months and uh, perhaps longer. And during that long period of time, because this is over a year, you see <coughs> Uh, continued maturation of the uh, immune response, both of the antibody response as well as the T cell response that occur and continued production of antibody secreting cells uh, to measles virus over a very long period of time. So there's long-term stimulation of the immune system that occurs with natural wild-type uh, measles infection. So measles falls into the category of uh, one of the viruses that uh, is uh, maintained in a human population by being very infectious. So these are the outline of the various strategies viruses can use to be maintained in a human population, i.e. to prevent being eradicated. Uh, <coughs> and so if you... Um, uh, one, one way is just to be a persistent virus infection, so HIV and uh, hepatitis C virus fall into that category where people are infectious for a very long period of time, don't have to be very efficient at being at transmission, but uh, there's many opportunities for transmitting the virus to another individual and maintaining it. Then the herpes viruses, of course, uh, can establish latency and be reactivated much later and be infectious, again, for uh, other individuals. 
But then the group of viruses that most uh, viruses fall into, including measles, uh, <coughs> are acute viruses. Uh, mostly, most of the RNA viruses uh, fall into this category. And they're infectious for only a very short period of time. So they have to be very uh, well transmitted from, efficiently transmitted from one individual to another because not only are they uh, individuals infectious for only a short period of time, but then once they recover, they are, uh <coughs> they're immune for uh, life if it's an optimal uh, immune response. So, but these uh, viruses are also the ones that are targets for eradication. You now have the parameters that you need for maintaining uh, immunity and preventing uh, transmission uh, in the, with this kind of uh, virus, and smallpox certainly fell into that uh, category. So these are, this is a version of D.A. Henderson's uh, things that a virus needs in order to be able, or we need in order to be able to eradicate uh, a virus. And <coughs> so, uh, first of all, that these are human viruses, so you don't have reservoirs, either insect or animal reservoirs, to worry about. That the virus, uh, <coughs> the ones in blue are the ones that are kind of unique for measles that are not necessarily true for, were not necessarily true for smallpox, but <coughs> that the virus uh, spreads these, uh, respiratory transmission and people are infectious prior to the onset of the rash, so that recognizing the, the disease is, uh, is more difficult than it is an infectious person, is more difficult than it was with smallpox. Permanent immunity after recovery, uh, and then the spread of the virus by this respiratory route has made it uh, much more efficiently uh, transmitted. Transmission stops spontaneously in remote areas of Faroe Islands. We're a good example of that, and there are others. Uh, <coughs> and then uh, the vaccine provides long-term protection. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the vaccine and what we know, and, and what we know about long-term protection uh, with the uh, with the vaccine. But it's a highly efficacious uh, vaccine. So the isolation of measles uh, virus uh, uh, enabled the development of a vaccine, and that was accomplished by uh, John Enders in the 50s. And <laughs> the, vi the virus that he isolated was from a child named David Edmonston, and that wild-type virus was then the basis for the development of most of the vaccines that are currently used uh, against measles. So that, uh <coughs> and it was attenuated uh, by classic methods, uh, basically passage, passage in a tissue culture cells that were non-human, i.e. adapting it to a, uh, an unnatural host, and in this case most of the attenuation was probably in chicken cells. <coughs> and uh, though these are attenuating passages here, and uh, in the s red squares are three vaccines that are currently very commonly used worldwide, all derived from the same original vaccine. Schwartz and Morton actually have the same sequence. Uh, Zagreb is, a, is, is slightly different. So, th but the vaccines that we're using are all very closely, uh, closely related and derived from these original wild type. There's a been a lot of sequencing done of uh, vaccines. Interestingly, we do not understand attenuation for this, uh, this vaccine. We do not know what the determinants of attenuation uh, are. <coughs> so uh, comparison in, in boxes are, are uh, amino acid changes that are common to all of the vaccines. But, and they're in many different genes, as you can see. So we do not understand yet what, uh, which, which ones of those are contributing to the attenuated uh, phenotype of the vaccine. Nevertheless, the vaccine has uh, been very successful. And uh, these are just early data from uh, the first introduction of the vaccine into the United States and, and the rapid decrease in the numbers of cases of uh, measles that occurred with that uh, introduction. So the current vaccine is a live attenuated virus. It's derived from this Edmondson strain of, uh, of measles virus. Because it's a live attenuated virus, it has uh, <laughs> properties that require a cold chain in order to maintain the viability of the virus. 
It's given by needle and syringe, either subcutaneously or intramuscularly, uh, usually around a year of age, in order to avoid the uh, uh, maternal antibody that would be still present in an infant at the, uh, an earlier uh, age. Not er everybody responds to the vaccine the first time. So a second dose we now know is needed, and that was introduced in the early 90s as, a, as an additional uh, requirement. And that's in order to, uh, to increase the proportion of people who are actually uh, immune to so catch up the people who didn't respond, the children who didn't respond to the first, uh, first vaccine. And it's uh, very widely used. It's safe, efficacious. It's, a, it's a really a great vaccine. <coughs> but it isn't as the immunity that it induces is very similar to the immunity that we see to wild type virus, but it's not as durable. And this these are just uh, lots of examples in the literature, but this is uh, one of, of the decline in, uh, in, in children that are considered uh, immune over time. And this is over a three year time span, uh, having been given uh, different uh, vaccines by different routes. So there's a decline in the, uh, the amount of antibody over time that we don't really see with uh, after wild type uh, infection. So we've, in, we've uh, infected monkeys with, uh, when compared directly with the vaccine and, and wild type virus to try to compare the immune responses that are occurring in uh, these uh, macaques. Uh, <coughs> the red line are, are the antibody responses to the H protein, which are the neutralizing antibody responses uh, <coughs> uh, to wild type virus. And uh, the blue line is uh, responses to vaccine virus, both given by the same route and the same, uh, the same dose. <coughs> so the, the, uh, the responses are lower. Uh, <coughs> on the, uh, the next panel are the plasma cells in the bone marrow. And it's the plasma cells in the bone marrow that maintain that long-term antibody response. So how do you uh, get those plasma cells that continue to produce antibody over years of time from the uh, bone marrow. And what you can see is that, that, uh, that there are uh, many fewer uh, that are established after vaccination compared to uh, the numbers that you see uh, after wild type uh, infection. So the antibody response is not as, uh, as robust. However, interestingly, the T cell response is comparable. So uh, it, it's primarily a difference in the antibody uh, responses uh, for the vaccine versus a wild type infection. And <coughs> one characteristic which has been noted by uh, other groups, uh, ABS for instance, uh <coughs> is the fact that the uh, vaccine virus does not replicate nearly as well in lymphoid tissue as uh, the wild type virus. So that persistence that we see in the wild type virus of uh, RNA is in lymphoid tissue uh, as well as PBMCs for a very long period of time. And that's uh, a much lower, uh, many fewer uh, cells are, are positive in the lymph nodes for uh, a vaccine virus than for wild type virus. And this looks at purple blood mononuclear cells, again in red as the wild type virus numbers of PBMCs that are positive for measles uh, versus the uh, vaccine uh, uh, virus, again, in, in macaques uh, that were uh, infected. Nevertheless, the vaccine works, and it works very well. Uh, <coughs> and based on that, it was uh, declared in 1997 uh, by the WHO and other uh, organizations involved uh <coughs> that uh, measles eradication should be a goal for, uh, for the world. Uh <coughs> and uh, they uh, said that the tools we had were sufficient to, uh, we didn't need a new vaccine, et cetera. Uh <coughs> and that the goal was uh, 2005 to, uh, to 2010. So how are we doing? Well, first of all, this is a distribution of just one dose of measles worldwide. Uh, this is 2014 data, but it's similar now. Uh, <coughs> basically, uh, in much of the developed world, you get a single dose of vaccine uh, to most, uh, most children, but there are certainly regions, uh, particularly in, uh, in Africa, where that's been more challenging to, uh, to accomplish. 
So getting the vaccine out and into uh, the individuals who need it has not been uh, as uh, efficacious as we would hope. But it's not just developing countries that have had problems with uh, measles and continue to have problems with measles. So I'll show you a couple of examples. Uh, one is uh, the United States, uh, <coughs> where um, these are the numbers of cases in the United States. And uh, in 2014, we had uh, more than almost 700 uh, cases with a major uh, outbreak. <coughs> Elimination from the U.S., which uh, elimination means that there's no more endemic transmission. So all of the cases that we see are initiated with importations from, uh, from other countries, but uh, their ability to spread then within the population is very dependent on the level of, uh, of immunity in that population. And uh, uh, the, uh, uh, this, is, this is this year, this is incomplete data for 2018, and we have uh, a couple of fairly large outbreaks ongoing now in uh, New Jersey and New York. So um, uh, we continue to have some problems, and we have pockets of, uh, of individuals who are refusing uh, to vaccinate their, uh, their children. How's Europe doing? Well, these are the cases in, in Europe over time from 2010 to 2018. Again, these are two regions in the world that certainly have the infrastructure and the ability to immunize their population if they want to. Uh, <coughs> so uh, big outbreaks uh, occurring. Uh, the, the Nader was really about, uh, I think, 2014, 2016, I think. Uh, but uh, then there, uh, and this is uh, current data, 2018 data, uh, which, and the two colors are just whether the cases have been uh, uh, absolutely confirmed or not. Uh, so you can see there's very large outbreaks now ongoing in, uh, in Europe. So if we look at the cases uh, in each of these instances, why are these people getting, uh, getting measles? Uh, and this, these are data from Switzerland, but they're uh, similar data from uh, other parts of the certainly developed world. Uh, and the blue bars, the uh, solid blue bars here, are all individuals. And this is ages of, uh, of people who got uh, measles, and there's a lot of young adults in this uh, population. Uh, <coughs> and, but the solid blue bars are people with no history of vaccination. So the vast majority of people that are involved in these outbreaks, both in Europe and the United States, are individuals who are no history of, uh, of vaccination. So the failure of, uh, of measles control is uh, uh, multifactorial, uh, need for very high coverage to interrupt uh, transmissions. To do that, you need to get uh, two doses of, uh, of vaccine into the population in order to get that immunity. Uh, herd immunity needs to be about 92% or more in order to uh, uh, prevent uh, transmission. Certainly in, in developing countries, there's problems with uh, delivery, both with the infrastructure for uh, uh, providing uh, the first dose in, uh, in infants and even more so to providing the second dose. And so uh, approaches there have been these mass immunization campaigns, which are very effective, but they're very expensive. They're very time consuming. They're very difficult for the health uh, system to manage. And then there's little, it went, once they work, there's a little motiv motivation to keep them up if you've uh, uh, suppressed measles transmission in your country. The need for a cold chain, and then needles and syringes for, uh, for delivery of the vaccine uh, require skilled health workers. But there's also problems in the developed uh, countries, as I've just illustrated, uh, and that's with problems with vaccine acceptance, uh, both safety worries, which are um, unfounded, but nevertheless uh, persist. And then uh, the uh, sort of fundamental argument of, uh, which is I mean, ongoing ever since vaccination was first introduced, uh, of uh, individual rights versus uh, public health and whether you can mandate uh, uh, vaccination or not. And then a question of secondary vaccine failure. We know this occurs, but right now, I don't think there's any evidence that that is an important contributor to uh, the failure to, uh, to control measles. So the work from my lab was done by uh, uh, 
these individuals um, <laughs> uh, when, uh, and they were uh, basically students in the lab, and this is Ashley, who getting her degree last year, <laughs> and Nicole, Bob Adams, who is our veterinarian, primate veterinarian, and Kelly Pate as well, uh, our primate veterinarians, without which we can't accomplish much of anything. So thank you, and I'm glad to take any questions. Thank you.